All right, guys. Um, I'm doing a little demo here, and we're talking about the basics of things that we need to do to draw an interior of a warehouse. You guys are going to be doing thumbnails for me, a minimum of five thumbnails over the weekend, and you have Monday off, so you'll bring them in on Wednesday, and then we'll take a look at them. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some steps on here. Step number one. So we're going to talk about how to start. Okay. So how do we start right now? Step number one is we're going to draw a frame. Okay. Step number two, we're going to draw a horizon line. Step number three, we're going to draw a vanishing point. S step number four, we're going to draw the back wall. Step number five, we're going to draw the side walls. Okay. And here's exactly how it happens. If I come back in here, I put the horizon line in the grid right there. I have that done. Okay, so that's step two and step three. Label your vanishing point. So if I come in here right now, and if I go to my touch here, and I always like to put, it's sort of a good habit, it's the way that I was taught, is if you come in and put, I'm going to darken this just a tiny bit. If I put a little dot right here, and it's a little hard to see, but I can put VP1, just to remember that's your key vanishing point. Because sometimes you'll have lots of lines going, and you'll forget, you might think your vanishing point is over, and what will happen is sometimes students end up having multiple vanishing points back here where the wall is on one vanishing point, one box is on another vanishing point, and it doesn't look, like, doesn't look right. Now, the walls, I know this might be a question, no one's asked it yet, the walls can all have to be on one vanishing point, correct? Yes. But every box does not have to be on a, the same vanishing point. Why? Because boxes rotate and change. Okay? But for the most part, for this assignment, we'll get to that a little bit later. Yes, Nathan? You will see that happen. That's the purpose of drawing this. So you, the majority of what you're drawing will be inside the cone of vision. What will happen is I'll do another demo, another quick drawing for you in a second here. Because we're going to start like this, having the horizon line um, sort of close to the middle and the vanishing point in the middle. The problem with that, there's a lot of symmetry and it gets to be a little boring. So what you're going to do eventually is you're going to take that vanishing point and you're going to pitch it over to one side. When you do that, you're going to see what happens when you start to draw a series of boxes on the far left-hand side. So this is what I mean by that, to answer that question. Is don't worry about the cone of vision right now, I just want you to draw. So if I put the vanishing point right here, and if I come in here and if I throw a quick grid off of this, and then when I come back here and I start to draw a box, I'm going to start to get a little bit more distortion because I'm, I'm way out of that cone of vision. Okay, if I come over here, find my stationary point, look back this way, that's about my 60 degree marker. So boxes over here are going to be having acute and obtuse angles, and they could look a little distorted. But don't, don't worry about that now, just I want you to get in there, I want, you to ex I want you to experience that firsthand. Because you have to have that understanding of what happens when you're working on something and you're getting this weird cone of vision effect. Okay, hold on a minute. Can you erase that there? So that's an excellent question. Just wait for that. Okay, so then back to this step number three. Then I drew the back wall, okay? And after I drew that wall here, then step four is I came from my vanishing point, I connected through the corners of that back wall, and I created the ceiling, the left and right wall, and then now I have the floor there. And now it's just about filling it with boxes. Okay, so that's how we get started. And then over here... I'm going to put down a little comment section, okay? What not to do. Okay, and this is important, all right? So one of the things we talked about not doing was this, is that as we're creating boxes and building up our warehouse, we don't want to have a box that ends. So I don't want to come in here and say, hey, box here, and then just do this, because it's not going to look right. It, and the reason why it doesn't look right is it ends right on my horizon line right there. Okay, I can't see on top of it or underneath it. So that was number one. Okay. So what not to do, number one there, is to, I'm going to put end on horizon line. Step number two, what not to do, okay, is tangents or tangencies, okay? So technically what I did there on that horizon line is a tangent. Even though we can't see the horizon line, it's there. And with the box ending, it just looks funny. 
Okay, so the next thing was a tangency, and that's where here would be a tangency. If I came in here and decided to draw a box like this, that's not good. Because that box now is exactly on the same position as the box above it. I mean, excuse me, below it. So this is ending right on the same line, the same line, the same line. Not good. It just doesn't look right. However, if I did this, you just shift it a little bit. If I do that a little bit, if I pull that over, and if I end that box a little bit earlier, that looks great. Okay, that looks absolutely fantastic. So, number three. Okay, Any, can anyone think of anything else that we don't want to do? We, I mentioned something else earlier about the ending of the box. So step number three is called drawing through. Actually, I'm going to rephrase this. I'm going to say drawing inside shapes. And what do I mean by that? If I decided to come back right now, this happens all the time in students' portfolios. Someone will come in here and do this. Hold on a minute. I noticed my color's off a little bit. Let me get it back there. Someone will come over and do this. Why is it drawing so light? And they will come in. Oh, Bill? What? Yeah, I just noticed that. That's okay. No worries. <laughs> I give up at this point. See, it's just stupid. Every time I hit this little clicker, that's supposed to be to adjust brush. Someone has arranged this clicker to be, you know what, let me just do this. Yeah, I'm just going to go in here and reset preferences real quick. Um, I forget in Photoshop where that is. That's on edit. It's a different menu. Keyboard shortcuts. Um, oh no, you do it different on a Mac. You go find the folder and you delete all the preferences. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Application menus, Photoshop default. Well, you know, I'm not going to worry. How you do it on a Mac is you go in and you have to find, you go to the file in applications. You open that file and then there's a preference folder. You select it and delete it. When you restart it, all your preferences are reset. Okay, so anyway, that's okay. I don't I don't mean to be, let me see if I, how many steps I can back up here and get off. Yeah, this is all, here, let me just erase this. And I'll just redraw it super fast. What I'll do is I'm going to put a lock on the grid. Oops. Sorry. Oops. Gosh, darn it. So I'm hitting the wrong. Is my lock? Oh, there it is. Okay. And there we go. Now I should, should be fine. Okay. So let's come back over here and I'll just sketch that the box that I drew up here and look like about yay big. Okay. All right. Thank you for pointing that out. Now, that's probably why because. It was so light, and that's, I didn't realize, like, why is it not, you know. Okay. So the problem is what I was just getting to here about drawing through on the other shapes, because I get this all the time from students. I'll get that right there. And the problem with this is this. I have to draw through. That happens to line up. Okay. If I draw through that shape, and I have to look, Look at the distance from here to the wall. I only have that much of a distance. You see that? This is the wall line. So someone will throw a box back there. Now this one will fit because look, you see how that just barely fits right in there? That's called drawing through the shape. Or, okay, or drawing inside shapes. That's really important because I can look at a drawing very quickly and if somebody did this, It's not my day today. I can tell you that right now. I just filled my clock. It's all right. I have good days and bad days. And I knew once I got on to traffic, we can get angry moms in their minivans. I knew it was not going to be. 
I was like this, and there's this little space, and so I went like this, and this model gave me this dirty look. <laughs> right by Cal State Fullerton, and I was all, it's open, I'm going to take it. You know? So look at what happens here. If I draw that box, it's going to hit, let's say the box is a little bit longer, it would hit that corner wall, basically. So I, that's a, my example's getting a little foreshortened there, but you can see here, it would probably hit the wall depending on where the wall hits. So that's what we call drawing through the shapes. That just squeezes in there just perfectly, but it's really common where people will then come in and this is exactly what somebody will do next, is they'll come over here and they'll do this. And I'm like, whoa, there's no way you could have that box there. Because if you drew through the shape and you figured out where that came down and hit the ground right there, you see that? It would be going way into the wall at that point. So the distance from here to here, there's no way that next box could be there. But students do that all the time, and I will catch it in the drawing. And it's not that I'm being picky. It's that that's really common for people to do because most people haven't been taught how to draw through a shape or think about objects as cubes that you can look through. Okay, all right, so that was number three, drawing through the shapes. Um, number four, okay, I'm going to put in here offset angles. What does offset angles mean? You guys will get tired of drawing boxes straight all the time, so then one of you will get daring and you will do this. And you will say, okay, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to draw a box tilted. Ooh, right? Whoa. Well, you have to remember that's still a 90 degree angle, okay, on that box technically. So what students will do is they'll get a little sloppy and then I start getting offset angles when they do something like this and it doesn't look correct. It, it gets drawn and then they'll come up here and they'll do that and that'll be going that way. And so what ends up happening is I have offsets. I have angles that don't match each other. So boxes tend to be, some boxes are shaped at different angles. Okay, some have, you know, uh, other parts that extrude out. It's just going to be a lot easier if you just keep everything at a right angle for right now. So even if this goes up, comes over, and if I drop that down, I receive this back. So here. There. But be careful, get this all the time too, is I am purposely made that line right here. See what's happening? it's closer here and gets much wider there, okay? You don't want to do that either. That's called, that's offsetting angles again. So when you draw the line to another box, you make it a little crooked, and I can notice that those two lines are going to a converging vanishing point. It doesn't look right. So if I back up a couple steps here, and you go to draw that other line, just take your ruler and make sure it's nice and parallel to the other one, that it makes sense, okay? All right, so um, another thing of what not to do I'm going to call it the yarn theory. I've been teaching environment sketching for many years, okay, and I see this all the time. It's really common from students, especially on a first assignment if you're just getting your, your feet wet with perspective. draw a shelf right here. Now let's end our shelf right there. Thank you. Okay. 
This is okay for a start, but you're, you have to keep filling up the inside of the warehouse. The problem is what the yarn theory is about is if I could take a piece of string or yarn and if I could wrap it around numerous objects that are all over the location, those objects are going to feel like, does it mean or do I smell like nice perfume? I thought I just smelt something coming in from the door. Yeah, now Huh? Yeah. It, it's not just me, right? Yeah. Like someone just went into the bathroom and was like, <laughs> right? I'm like, that's pretty good perfume there, whoever put that on. Okay, so what you, what you want to avoid is, is doing something like this. If I could take what I call a piece of yarn in my string theory, and if I can wrap a piece of yarn around tons of stuff inside a location, all those elements are going to feel like they're floating. Okay, so that's where we get into something that's called grouping. Okay, um, grouping is a design premise about bringing objects together and establishing them as groups and what we call visual reads. So if I keep drawing, I have, you know, I have like a box here, and this happens a lot of times. It's not a bit, I just point this out to you now so you don't do it, all right? Oops. This is what will happen. Students are like, yeah, yeah, I did the assignment in boxes. I know, the problem is, is they're all over, and the eye doesn't really know what to look at. Okay, So that's where we get into grouping. Grouping is really, really important. So what grouping means is that right now, and I just do this out of habit, is that you see all the boxes that I drew over here on the left-hand side? All of these boxes are one big group because they're all overlapping and touching each other. So our human brain, our eye, sees this. We call this the exterior silhouette of an object or groups of objects. And that's the first thing that our brain reads is that outline shape right there. When objects are grouped together like that, they're in one grouping, it makes sense. It's an easy visual read. We look at it, and in a second we know that's a group of boxes. However, though, when we look over to the right, there's chaos happening. There's boxes everywhere. There's no order to them. We don't know. They're all similar. Some are similar in sizes. Like this size here is very similar to that size there. This size here is the same as that with there. You know, it's like we don't know what's important. We have no idea out of all these. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight boxes on the right side. I have no idea what box is of important or what area is of importance. Okay. Now that starts to branch into what we call composition. I'm not, we'll talk about composition a little bit later. Okay, we're not, you're not, you don't have to design warehouses with the best composition in the world. However, though, I want you to think about, there is a term whenever we draw anything, which is called focal point. So what is the area that you want your eyes to look at? So when we come back down to our warehouse description here, okay, which I think we, I took off. God, nothing is working today. There it is. Give me a minute here. Zoom out. Yeah, we didn't put on, I'll go back and put it on here. So when we were talking about our descriptors for our warehouse, we listed a bunch of things. We said warehouses have large windows. Okay, they have upper levels. They have doors. We listed all those little elements, right? You might think of having one particular station where they're like wrapping lots of the boxes and getting them ready to ship out. So there might be a cart there that might be stacked on the cart and they're getting ready to be pulled away. Okay, that could be more of a focal point. So what a general rule for focal point is this. The more intense the silhouette shape is and the more detail, the eye will go right to that area first and then the other areas around it will become secondary. So as you're doing little thumbnails for your warehouse, think about that and think about if I have, Phil said, if I have a stack of boxes, they're all one grouping with a unique silhouette to them. My eye will go there first and then if boxes on the side that might be filler objects or secondary, not as important, okay, my eyes are going to bypass that and they're not even going to want to really look at it. They're going to go right to the center mass. So right now, I can't have any center mass because of what? I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I got eight boxes. 
lying all over that are taking up space. I don't know what's important out of those boxes, okay? So what I mean by creating that center mass or whatever is this. So watch. I'm going to come back in here. I'm going to erase this box. Take out this guy. Take out that guy. Now, imagine this here. Let's say that I had say that I had a box here, and then maybe this guy ends about here. Let's say there's another box here, and let's say there's a box out like that. Okay. So that's just a real simple grouping of boxes stacked. Nothing too fantastic, right? Once I go in here, if I want to make this the focal point over here, all I have to do is make that the most interesting silhouette shape inside the piece. So if I come over here and I do this. So some of you don't know much about silhouettes or what they are. Okay, it's, it, it's, it's basically something, it's, the silhouette is an object filled with black with no interior detail where we're forced to look at the object's particular shape and communicate with the visual readers. However, though, in that same knowledge, if remember I talked about yarn? If I can wrap a line of red around it and it keeps going and it's a longer string with more intense lines and shapes, it's more visually appealing. So if I have a silhouette in red that looks like this, that's pretty boring because that's just a basically a round shape. But if I have a silhouette that looks like this, that's much more interesting and appealing to the human eye. Okay. So now as I come in here, then I'm going to... Oops. Uh, Okay, so now I have a grouping over here in that corner. So if I showed you this without having explained it to you before, you're going to end up going right there. Your eyes are going to focus right in that point. And the basic principle of that is that I have this right here on this guy's. The more interesting the silhouette shape is and the grouping is, the more the eye will go there. Okay, that is a lot more interesting than this or than this on the side. That's second. So if we had rate pieces one, two, and three, this would be the most interesting would be one. This would be secondary because it does have, it does go up and down a little bit. And this right here would be number three. Okay. So what I just did there, that's a quick definition for you about grouping. Grouping will help you define. So number six here was grouping, what to do, excuse me. What not to do is when you don't group. So step number how to start on number six here, I'm going to put down group boxes. Try not to have more than five groups. You want to stay under five. Usually three to five is just fine. If you do that, you're going to have instant success inside your piece. Okay. Let me show you a little secret here. I'm going to show you a concept artist who's really well known in the industry. It's one of my favorite pieces right here. See that right there? What are the groupings that we see inside that piece? This is Spark. His name is Nicolas Bouvier. He went to Art Center. Um, he, I think he's from Canada, Canadian French. Bouvier, that's got to be French, right? Um, and he's, he, he, he has his third book out which is, they're all great books, um, and he does a particular style of concept art. He works mainly in games. He's done Assassin's Creed, tons of work, right? 
is somebody I love looking at, okay? What's important in here? In terms of groupings, how many groupings are there in this piece? I'm gonna say five. Four and five. First grouping is the foreground here. One. That's one. What's the most interesting grouping in that piece? It's middle. The, exactly, the middle, where the focal point is, okay? So that's a grouping, that's two. This little mountain on the side here, midground, that's three. And then technically you can debate it, but there's a line here that separates that from that. So that's back behind that building, that's technically four. And then you just have a background in here which is roughed in, that's technically five. Under five, okay? If you create concept art, what's focal point? Shit. What are the groupings? Foreground. Right here with the guy in it, across. From this point to this point is midground. The background is roughed. Ship is focal point. To dictate scale, smaller ships on the side. Okay? All right, we'll get more into that a little bit later. But it's just great to see. You see how this starts to work. What are the groupings in here? If I were to draw a line from this and come across to here, technically from here to here is one group, even though there is the distance of foreground to midground happening. So you have foreground to midground, and then you have that shape, the large ship, and then you have a background, but it's just clouds. Nobody gives a damn what the background is sometimes. It could just be clouds. It just has to be that there's something there. It could be mounds. It fades away. What's important is the focal point. So what does this have to do with, this is a basic theory that has existed in designing and drawing for environments, rooms, and perspective, even if you're doing character design. If I have a character and he's holding a rifle and he has a backpack and there's, and there's like lots of long things coming off the backpack and then he has something hanging off of his hip with pointy objects and there's a giant silhouette on the guy and it pulls away from his face, it's not gonna look right. I need to think about what is the focal point inside that character. And if I want to look at his face, I have to find a way to accentuate a face. How do people accentuate their faces? Women do it every morning. Girls. Makeup. You create contrast on your face so someone will look at your face. That is what you do. When you put something on your eyes, it's to pull out the color of your eyeballs to create contrast. When you put a little bit of red on your cheeks, it's to make it look like you are full of blood and ready for mating, okay? <laughs> it's true. That's flushing. That's what people do, right? When women wear a necklace, yes, I, I, I'll go to the store and I'll buy something pretty for my wife and I'll be like, here. And I joke one day, I'm like, I'm creating contrast for you. And she's like, what? She doesn't get it. I'm like, just put it on. So when, when she has it on and it's shiny and there's a little diamond here, it creates contrast where you can see that. So everything is about creating contrast, right? So the same thing happens when you're doing environments, character designs, concept art, painting. It all continues through the whole spectrum. In fact, half of life is all about contrast, period, okay? So back to our environment here. So we just talked about grouping. We talked a little bit about focal point. The one thing that I didn't do in here that I believe is on, hold on, let me check the lecture that I did a demo of this. Is this right here? Is using foreground, midground, background, and one point perspective, okay? So I just showed you really quickly those three when we looked at Spark, right? Here's a demo that I have up here. I don't even know what this demo is of because I don't remember. So I think this is a room. Okay, exactly. So this is, let me get to the end of the demo. This is us designing up and drawing a room. So I want you guys to watch this demo when you're at home. Okay. It's linked up on the blog. It's there for you. But I, I draw a warehouse for you. However, though, everything else that I talked about earlier, I talked about grouping. We talked about the yarn theory and all that other good stuff, right? The one other thing I want you to now think about, okay, is, hold on, number seven right here. Okay, so we talked about grouping. 
uh, grouping and then grouping boxes together. So basically, I'm just going to put grouping there. Okay. And number seven is going to be creating foreground, midground, and background. Okay. If you do these last, what's funny is a lot of times when I give assignments, sometimes I don't touch upon this stuff. But I decided to introduce it to you early to make you more aware about it. So when you're drawing, you're thinking about what you're drawing. Okay, you're not just putting boxes all over the place. Now you're thinking about groupings, arrangements. We talked about visual reads, one, two, and three, right? And now we're talking about foreground, midground, and background. Foreground, midground, and background is one of the 12 steps of animation, one of the 12 principles on how something is believable or works and what it is. It is overlapping of shapes to create depth. Okay, so if I overlap one shape in front of another shape, I am creating depth because your mind immediately sees that and senses it. Right now here, number three is barely overlapping number one. You see that? It's just barely overlapping in this corner. However, in grouping number two, look at how much overlap I have. Is there a lot of depth happening right there? Absolutely. There's lots of depth because I have one large box here overlapping that box. Excuse me. These two boxes are overlapping these boxes. That box is overlapping that box. There's like four different types of overlap happening that creates depth inside the piece. How it transitions when I think about foreground and midground background is if you do this. Now you can come in here and I want you to draw an imaginary little line going from here and then draw one going across this way. And now you're going to on purposely create foreground, midground, and background inside your piece. And I do that in that demo for you. So I have, let me label them, FG, MG, BG for my background, right? What do I have right now in my midground on the right side? Nothing. There's nothing over there. So it's in my interest if I want to create some overlap in here, what I could do is what if I draw a box tilted on its side? What if I have a box up like this, leaning against this wall? And that box comes down like this. That box still now becomes connected into that particular grouping of number three. And now it starts to overlap a little bit more. But I want more overlap in there. So now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to draw a box like this. Ending before that, oops, hold on a minute. I made a little mistake there, I wasn't paying attention. Let me bring the box out to about here, to about there, and cap it there. There's the ground. Now I'm going to erase what it's overlapping. Okay, so now. I've established more of a midground there. I have a large box shape that's overlapping. It visually pulls me and ties me in by creating overlapping the shapes and using foreground, midground, background. Something else that is really fantastic that you will hear people say is use foreground elements. Foreground elements are objects that would be directly in front of you that are going to help overlap everything else in the background that will create more distance inside the piece. So what is a foreground element that I could put in here right now on the left side? I have some foreground space over here. So anyone? Any thoughts? Um, yes, sir, Nathan? I, I could put a person, which would indicate that's one thing I haven't done in this yet, which was I was going to talk about. That's like number eight about how to start. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in here on number eight. I'm going to put scale. I have not put anything in there yet to indicate scale. Okay, what I was going to suggest was like a stairway or a push cart. But, but yeah, you nailed yeah, it, though. Was like, if these boxes are like really big or some kind of warehouse, that would make them really small. That's right, because now look at what happens here. This is the important. So you, you hit exactly the same area I was going for, which was scale. Because what happens if I come in here and if I do this? Somebody's that tall. Well, there's some big boxes, right? <laughs> Everything changes. But if I come in and do that, and then if I do this, <laughs> I 
there's a problem now. There's a huge door in the background and the scale doesn't match up, right? Okay, so objects inside, we've already talked about transferring scale in another lecture. So objects inside your environment need to match up to the scale. If you want this to be this super large warehouse, so if I were to go back and look at the concept art, I'll tell you a little secret. One of the secrets that concept artists do, because we all do it, is we use and exaggerate scale to our benefit. Okay, let's go back to the concept art real quick. Not that you have to do that. I just want to make you aware of this, right? We're looking at this piece earlier. If that guy is that big there, that's his scale. And if I transfer his scale all the way back to right here, how big is he? He's tiny. He's like a dot. Look at how big that building is. It's like 100 stories tall. That's the power of scale. Okay? Look at how big and curvy and beautiful that ship is. And that guy's only that big right there. So that means if he was right there, he'd be like that big. And that ship is bigger than anything we've ever seen before. That's the importance of scale. Okay, once I dictate scale in a piece and do it correctly, that's, that's not really as much, he doesn't have as much there to find. Um, even when you, when you see a city shot, how do you dictate scale? By putting ships in there. The ships will help do it. A walkway, a handrail. So I was going to just talk about, you know, here you have this large entryway. How big are the characters walking that entryway? That's your scale. That defines how your rule is existing. So I have options here. This could be the interior of like a giant warehouse, and I need to decide how I want to define my scale. Well, I don't know if I would make somebody that small because I think that might be a little small, right? But I don't think I would do that door. I could come in here. These could be large packages or could be like a big device up that's grabbing it and moving stuff aside or whatever, right? But once I dictate scale in there, it's done. So there's a couple ways I could do that. One is what happens if I did this. I did this in the other drawing a little bit ago because I started to draw a push cart. So once I come in and I draw a particular prop, or something that identifies what the scale is. Oops, that's a little too thick. More like that. Uh oh, what happened to my push cart right there? Tangency. Bad news, Phil. I got to redraw my push cart. So I'm going to have to end that handlebar about here. Uh oh, still tangency. Tangencies are not good, right? Tangency, here's a rule on tangencies. If it touches or almost touches, still a tangency. It has to completely overlap it. If I completely overlap it, it doesn't feel nearly as bad. But this is from a bad spot because like any way I draw it, they're still like hitting another tangency in there. You know what I mean? I have a tangency on that wall right there. And then now I have to extend the, the back of the cart over, which extends the front of the cart. Yeah, so the railing still hits that wall. So then what you can do, and I've had to do this in drawings before, where you're like, you're adjusting it once and there's another one, there's another one, and you have to come back and keep adjusting it. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to end that box a little bit before, like that, maybe. And the box about there. Bring the box down to there. But it's still a little bit of a tangency. The best thing to do in that case would be just to go ahead and pull the cart all the way over to the left-hand side so it doesn't touch anything. But I'm going to leave it there for right now. I just, because this is a demo and I don't have a ton of time to, I just want to get it knocked out. Okay, so there, I have my there's my cart. That immediately dictates scale inside my piece. Okay, something else I could do 
is I could bring, so what are other tangency, I mean tangency, what are other foreground overlap shapes that we might see? You just have to use your imagination here. When you think about a factory. Well, I could have a pile of boxes stacked up in the foreground. Okay, so like I could use something like this. I could come in here and go, oh, Phil's got it. I'm gonna have one big box here. There's gonna be another box on top of it. And that one's gonna overhang. I'll see underneath it a little bit. And then that'll go up. And then they'll have another box overhanging on top of that. So that's now this huge shape here overlapping all this. That's now a nice little foreground element that creates more depth inside my piece. Okay, another foreground element that I can do. What if I had stairs that came down and they landed with a railing? So that might be a little complicated for you guys to draw. You're like, but how did it just start with cubes, right? So if I come back here, let's say there were stairs and they came off and I draw where it hits the ground. That's where my stairs are gonna hit. And then they're, they're gonna go upward. So now I'm gonna draw up. That's gonna be, let's say the base of my stairs are there. So I'm gonna draw that first step. And then I'm gonna go up. And then I'm gonna draw across again. Come back from the vanishing point, recede back this way. And then I'm gonna go up again. And then I'm just gonna recede it back. Draw a line across here. I need to figure out my stairs ended here, right? So now I have to draw through the shape. Some of you are like, what the heck is he doing? I found this corner right here, corner A, I just found right there. Because now I need to draw the line back that goes to point B. So now when I come back here, I'm gonna draw the line back. And where that line goes back and hits this line here, that's now gonna be B. Wait a minute there. Yep, that'll be B. And then technically that would go up. All I have to do is find this upper level though. So how I do that is, look, if I draw, transfer the scale. If I draw a dotted line over, I draw a dotted line back through the other side, and I draw a dotted line up right here, there's my answer right there. See how I did that? And now there's my stairs. So now I can come back in here and erase all this overlap And there's a pair of stairs in there. What do stairs have? Railings. So now I'm going to come in here and draw a railing like that. And draw a railing centered here. The railing, I'm going to match the angle of the stairs, meaning I'm going to draw a line on top of the stairs. I'm going to come up and maybe angle it about the same, maybe a little bit of a difference to create the top of the railing. And then when the railing hits the top, I come back to the vanishing point. And I draw a line going straight back. And then I look at that distance. That means the next one here would be about right here. And then what do I do? And then I do proportional division. Because what is inside this railing right here? A square, a box. So if I cross it, find the end, draw a line through that point, where it hit right there, I just did proportional division. I now have the next railing in perspective, proceeding back, okay? Then I could do the other side if I want, but you can see it starts to get a little bit more complicated, but I just drew foreground elements in there, okay? So step number one was creating foreground, midground, background. I did that by sketching these light little lines in there. One of the great things about a background is that backgrounds can be really light and secondary. They don't need a ton of detail. So like back here on this wall, if I want to fill in this background, it's really easy. I just have to put a couple little details. Now, there's something else that I have from my years of teaching. While I was working you know, professionally in the industry, I would go teach at Lagoon College of Art and Design, and then I taught at, at the online school of CGMA for numerous years, right? And I picked up this little term myself. It's a term that I use. It's called dead corners. And what dead corners are, are areas inside the drawing that have no linear detail that are dead. Okay, so I've given you all my little tips here. So we're creating foreground, background, background. Number eight, we talked about scale. Um, number nine, we talked about overlap of shapes. Okay, and number 10, the final number 10, 
the fantastic is no dead corners. Where's the dead corner in there right now? Right. right here. That's dead. Nothing's there. What about right here? Almost dead. Right here. Dead. Dead. There's nothing else inside that environment there. Okay. So how do I fix that? Well, I just ask myself some questions. Buildings, rooms, all kinds of buildings have moldings in them. So I come over, I draw a little line going that way. I draw a little line going this way. I draw a little line going that way. I now created molding. Okay? Ceilings have light. I don't have to do anything super fancy. Watch this. I'm going to draw a straight line from here to here. I'm going to go into that straight line. I'm going to divide it into three sections. Two inches. Oh, wait a minute here. I off measure two, two. Okay, hold on. I need to pull it back a little bit more. Let's see if I can get two, 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 and two. There. Equal marks. Straight line, one point perspective, right? And now I'm going to put a pair of lights in there. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to come up here, draw a line going that way. Come back to that next marker. Line going that way. Line going that way. Line like so. Now I'm going to divide it up. I'm going to just hold shift. Put one line across there. It could be tile, it could be lights. I don't even know right now. It doesn't matter. It's just to fill the space. I need to find out where the next line is going to go. How do I do that? Portion division. Across from corner to corner. Corner to corner. I find the middle. Come to right there. I connect from that corner through that middle point. The next line is going to be right there. There we go. Then I can even do the next line. So I come from that edge through there and see if it hits before or goes past. No, it hits before. Right there. Next line now is right here. Okay? So now I put something in the ceiling. I put some type of linear information that doesn't make it look and feel so blank and empty, right? And I could just keep doing that. So I have this shelf here. What does shelves have? have support brackets on them all the time okay or they might have this might have a little leg that pops out of it like this so then I can come here draw a little square in here and draw that leg coming down there it's that much of a distance it's like a little square so I have a little support leg there um, what are other things I might see if you look around inside of course, there's nothing in here. All the air vents are hung. But you see air vent. And you see lights. So well, let me come over here and put, let's put some windows in here. Put one set there, another set there. I'm going to make these large warehouse windows. A little bit of a tangency there, but that's okay for right now. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to get fancy. I'm going to put a recession on the window going outward. So I'm going to draw a line, horizontal line going this way. And then where that line hits, I'm going to draw a line like this. And I'm going to draw the line down. And then I'm going to come in, put a little bit of trim on the outside of the window, and I'm going to put the lines of the window. Okay? Then I'll just, I'm going to eyeball this, I'm just going to splice it twice to make it look like a factory window. So now I put windows in. Now I don't have a dead corner over there anymore. So you got to talk to yourself and ask yourself what are filler objects? Okay? So I'll put that as number 11 here. Filler, oops, filler detail. What is filler detail? It is the coping along the wall that goes. Here's just a general, a general rule. If you go look at your house, you probably never ever notice this, but you never have 
one surface usually hit one surface and be totally empty and bland. So when, when the carpet hits the wall, you guys have something in your house called baseboards that are there. It's because a wall against the wall is dead empty. Or you have a baseboard, and then you have the wall. So when you get up to the ceiling, the ceiling has this white, I don't know what it is, cancer-causing material up there that's hanging right, white styrofoam, whatever, that's going across, and they're all little squares and details, and there's lights oriented inside that, okay? Um, you just start looking and you start paying attention to some of these details. In your house, you have air conditioning vents on the wall. Here we have a fire alarm, a little sensor. There's no reason why I couldn't come in here right now, and I couldn't come in here like this, draw a little line, coming down here, a little box like that, a little light. Um, there's piping going all over warehouses. So maybe coming out of the ceiling right here, there's a big pipe that comes down. And then maybe it curves a little. And then it takes off and goes this way. And maybe it does the same little curve coming back this way. And then maybe it drops down the wall and then catches and goes into the wall. Okay, so that's filler detail. Thinking of ways to fill up the whole entire location. All these little details that we take for granted that are around you, okay? But let's just, I know there was a lot there I threw at you today and I drew this whole little warehouse, but remember where we were in step one it was just a couple boxes. So as you're drawing in your thumbnails and you're sketching over this weekend and over next Monday, I want you to go through and ask yourself, we talked about starting, okay? We talked about a frame, we talked about a horizon line, vanishing point, draw the back wall, draw the side walls, start drawing boxes, start grouping, okay? Creating foreground, midground, background, oops. Then after that, we develop scale, overlap the shapes, no dead corners, and filler detail. That's it. I know it sounds like a lot, but <laughs> once you do a couple of those things, some of you guys will be blown away You'll be sitting there, and after an hour of sketching, you'll be like, I drew my first warehouse. And it made sense. And that's awesome. It is. Because there is a great feeling as an artist when you do something and you nail it. Okay? So let me talk about that really quick here. That's called learning curves. This is how you learn as an artist. Okay? A lot of you are going to be doing this right now. You are going to have, this is called the plateau going across. That's called the jump in your learning when you figure something out and do it for the first time and it makes sense. And then what happens is then you have a plateau again where you're doing it okay for a little bit and it takes a little bit more practice or repetition and then you do it again and then you jump. The problem is The problem is this, when you get to be an older guy like me, the more that you learn on anything you do in your life, the jumps get lower and the plateaus get longer. That means you have to do more repetition and more practice to get better at something. This is the same metaphor for music, for playing an instrument, for theater, for dancing, for whatever it is that you want to do, for weightlifting, for sports, you name it, for running. Okay, I love to run. I don't do it as much as I should, but um, I have to because the motorcycle riding season is almost here and it's time to go dirt biking. Okay, so you guys are going to be here and you're going to draw and you're going to have a quick jump. You're going to be like, oh my god, I overlap shapes. I have something that feels like a realistic environment in shapes. You know, I have this cool warehouse that's coming together. And then you're going to bring it in here and then I'm going to tear it down. Not in a bad way, but I'm going to look at it. I'm going to point out problems that you won't see, but then you'll go back, and then your plateau is going to get a little bit longer. I mean, you're going to have to do a couple more repetitions, but then you'll have another jump, and you'll get better. The problem that happens is the older that you get, your jumps become more diminished and smaller, 
and the plateaus become longer where you just have to practice and practice and practice for sometimes even years at a time and then all of a sudden you get better and you will see yourself get better. Have any of you in here of artists noticed yourself getting better from classes? You notice the jumps that you do. And part of that is the way that you interpret and process information or steps. So one of the things that I try to do in this class being applied is I try to show you how the perspective works and I try to show you the steps on how to get there and then it's your job to go in and do the repetition part. If you do not do the repetition part, you are not going to get better. It's that simple and you will fail. It's literally that easy of an equation. Because I have students that come across all the time and they're like, how do I get better? What do I need to do? And Patrick Ballesteros was here. He was talking about students that he meets and they're like, what do I need to do to become, what, what pen do you use? Well, I'm going to buy that pen because that's going to make me an awesome artist. No, it's not the pen that makes you an awesome artist. It's not the sketchbook that makes you an awesome artist. It's not the ruler. A lot of those things help. Color erased pencils help. Prismacolor pencils are great to sketch with. They're better than pencil, but what helps you and gets you better is the constant repetition and practice. It's sort of that easy and that simple, okay? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let me stop the lecture right here, put an end to it real quick, because I, I just wanted to, thought I would record.